Well, good morning again. I'm Pastor Mike Sullivan. I get to serve Emmaus City Church in Worcester, Massachusetts. If I haven't had the joy of meeting you, uh, maybe after the service we'll get an opportunity. I just love the sound of rain. Uh, so during the service, it's just not only imagining uh, what it's like for creation itself to be soaking up God's goodness uh, through what he's provided to bring forth the colors that we love during spring, but also knowing that God's grace is raining down on us. Um, I mentioned the season of Eastertide, and for those that are unfamiliar maybe with that word, it's the 50 days between Easter and Pentecost. And so it's this tide of joy because we know that if Jesus is risen, he can not only meet us in the deepest depths that we endure, but that he can lift us up. Because if death and sin and evil and hell couldn't keep him down, and he comes to us in love, then those things can't keep us down if we're with him. We're actually going to look at a story that is probably familiar to some of you. It's very familiar to me because it's where we get the name of our church. But it's actually a part of scripture that Jesus' people around the world are looking at this weekend. And so if you have a Bible, you can open it up to Luke chapter 24. Uh, we're going to look at verses 13 through 17 and then verses 28 through 34. I'll read them out loud and then pray for the preaching of God's word. So again, this is in Luke chapter 24 verses 13 through 17, and then we'll also read verses 28 through 34. Again, after the resurrection of Jesus. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And they stood still, their faces downcast. As they approached the village of Emmaus to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, and he gave thanks, and he broke it. He began to give it to them, and then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? And they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven, and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Lord, we just sing, O Master, let me walk with thee. Lord, your name and your word, curiosity and fear, hope and joy have brought us here together. You've walked with us to bring us to this place of gathering. Now reveal yourself to us. May your scriptures burn in our hearts, God, in ways that only your spirit can make happen. And I pray, Lord, that the light and the joy and the curiosity and the healing of the resurrection would be experienced by all of us here today. Just like you did with Cleopas and the other disciple, just like you did with those that you encountered back in Jerusalem, Lord, you're alive. You are really risen. It's daring to say, and yet it is our hope of hopes. Reveal yourself through the preaching of your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. We sang, O Master, Let Me Walk With Thee. It's a song by Reverend Washington Gladden, written in 1879. Reverend Washington Gladden was a congregational preacher who, in the midst of 
his service to the Lord was very focused on how to apply the power of the gospel to everyday issues and problems. So he was very thoughtful about how does the good news of the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus, as well as the sending of his spirit and his coming return, apply to the muck and the mire and the mundane and messy of our everyday lives. So if you might have missed the verses, or maybe that song was new to you like it was new to me, some of the words that were said or that we sang over each other were, teach me your patience, still with thee in closer dear company, in trust that triumphs over wrong, in hope that sends a shining ray far down the future's broadening way, in peace that only thou canst give, with thee, O Master, let me live. Words, patience, Words, peace. Words, triumphing over wrong. And honestly, who doesn't want someone in your life right now that is patient with you? Patient like Jesus was with these disciples on the Emmaus Road. Who doesn't want someone in your life right now that gives you peace when you're distraught, when you're downcast, like the disciples were on the Emmaus Road? Who doesn't want someone in your life right now that when you have wrongs inside of you or around you can look you in the eyes and say, I have triumphed over that and I share my victory with you. See, we all need and we all want patience with us, peace for us, as well as triumph over the things that try to destroy us and devour us. And Jesus reveals the God that is with us. Francis Spufford is a British author who wrote a book, Unapologetic, Why Despite Everything, Christianity Can Still Make Surprising Emotional Sense. It's poetic and it's punchy. He's British, so it's, it's a bit brash. Might not resonate with all of you, may find some things you'll disagree with, but in one chapter called Yeshua, I think Francis does a wonderful job of kind of showcasing Jesus in a way that connects with those that never really been into religion, not really sure about this whole God thing, wondering who Jesus is and whether he really was a historical figure. And I love how Francis says this about Jesus that I think we capture a glimpse of on the Emmaus Road. And maybe you need to capture a glimpse of him again today. He says, each person in front of Yeshua is, is, for that moment, the one missing sheep. Each person in front of Yeshua is, for that moment, the one missing sheep. He never says that anything or anyone is too dirty to be touched. That anyone is too lost to be found. Even in situations where there seems to be no grounds for human hope, he will not agree that hope is gone beyond recall. Wreckage may be written into the logic of the world, but he will not agree that that is all there is. He says, more can be mended than you fear. Far more can be mended than you know. What a word. He says, more can be mended than you fear. Far more can be mended than you know. See, on the Emmaus Road, we get to look at, this morning, people who wanted hope to be true. They needed it to be true, and honestly, that's us too. And if we were to phrase this road with the Savior that's patient with us, with the Savior that gives us peace, with the Savior who truly triumphs over wrong, like we sang in, O Master, let me walk with thee, I would say this is a curious road, this is a vulnerable road, and this is a healing road. And so I invite you to walk this Emmaus road with Jesus this morning. First, with curiosity. Because this is a curious road with the really risen Lord who begins with questions. We looked at Luke 24, verses 13 through 17. And if you notice, the first thing that Jesus says to the disciples on that road is a question. In verse 17, Jesus asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? It's not that he didn't know. 
He's the risen Savior. We've seen in the gospel, he knows the hearts of those that are against him, as well as those that say, I believe, help my unbelief. But here we see a curious God. What a paradox. The omniscient God who is curious to draw out the hearts of those that he has compassion for. See, the Emmaus Road is a curious road, and it's a road that has questions, and I'm sure the road you're walking right now also has questions. 2023 has questions. You have wonderings in your wanderings. And if we look at Jesus and behold God, then he's the God who comes with compassion and curiosity about you, even though he knows you better than you know yourself. So I want to ask you, the disciples on the Emmaus Road heard, what are you discussing together as you walk along? What's the question that Jesus is asking you right now? Some of you may be more charismatic than others. Some of you may be less. But for those of you that are like, well, I go to the scriptures because I know I hear God's voice there, then hear the questions that Jesus asked throughout his life and maybe ask God right now, which question do I need to hear you ask me? These are some of the questions that Jesus asked in John chapter 1. What are you looking for? In John chapter 5, do you want to be well? In Luke chapter 8, where is your faith? Matthew chapter 6, are you not, not much are you not much more valuable than these things you see? Matthew chapter 9, do you believe I am able to do this? In Matthew chapter 16, who do you say I am? In Mark chapter 14, can you wait with me? In Mark chapter 15, why have you forsaken me? In John chapter 20, just a bit before Luke 24, why are you crying and who are you looking for? And in John chapter 21, after Luke 24, do you love me? What are you looking for? Do you want to be well? Where is your faith? Are you not much more valuable than these? Do you believe I am able to do this? Who do you say I am? Can you wait with me? Why have you forsaken me? Why are you crying and who are you looking for? And do you love me? We've come to listen to the Word of God, and here is the Word of God made flesh asking questions that resonated when He walked the earth, that resonate now as He sits on the throne. And so I ask you, which question have you considered recently that He may be asking you? What are you looking for? Do you want to be well? Where is your faith? Are you not so much more valuable than these? Do you believe I'm able to do this? Who do you say I am? Can you wait with me? Why have you forsaken me? Why are you crying and what are you looking for and do you love me? Again, which question, when I said it, maybe there was a little burning in your heart for a moment. There was a little pause. Maybe it was a question you've asked this week. Maybe it's a question you've been asking for a long time. Or maybe it's one you've never paused to let God ask you. Hold on to that question. The Emmaus Road is good to not only hear questions on, but to ask questions. In more of the Emmaus Road, we see that the question in that moment and the disciples being downcast, as he asks, well, what are you discussing together as you walk along? If we were to go on to verse 18, which we didn't read, but I'll read now, it says, one of them named Cleopas asked him, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened in these days? So we might have heard one of those questions and you might say, Jesus, don't you know? Where have you been? 
And whether that's a sarcastic response from you, whether that's a despairing response, whether that's a seemingly hopeless response, he's still with you listening. When he heard that question, he didn't say, how dare you? Don't you know who I am? He didn't say, well, that's the last straw. I'm out. No, he kept walking on this curious road. And that might challenge us right now. Maybe we've become too hardened with other people. We might think we're all good with God, but when we look at others, we're not curious about them anymore. We think, well, they're too far gone. The questions they ask are too angry or too hopeless. And Jesus is saying, no, I'm walking with them. I'm still curious. Do you want to become more like me? Maybe you have some people that you need to listen to, and when they lash out, instead of immediately going into your answers, maybe you should walk with them a little bit longer. What a beautiful Savior. And if we truly know him and love him as our master and want to walk with him, then we'll find ourselves on roads with others that are in those spaces too. Because this is not only a curious road, like I said, this is a vulnerable road. And it's not a road that we rush past. There's joy mixed in the sorrow. And we can find it if we continue on this vulnerable road with the really risen Lord who stays with us in the suffering. It's not only a curious road with the risen Lord that begins with questions. It's a vulnerable ro road with the risen Lord who stays with us in the suffering. Japanese theologian Kosuke Koyama said, love has its speed, and it's a spiritual speed. It's a different kind of speed from the technological speed to which we are accustomed. It goes on in the depth of our life, whether we notice or not, at three miles an hour. It's the speed we walk, three miles an hour, and therefore the speed the love of God walks. See, sometimes in wanting to escape our vulnerability or being uncomfortable with others' vulnerability, we try to speed past at a speed beyond love because if God is the God who walks with humanity in the cool of the day, if God is the God who walks the Emmaus Road, then he's not a 90-mile-an-hour God. He's a three-mile-an-hour God. That's the speed of walking. And that might be the question in the midst of helping you learn how to be more vulnerable are your days three miles an hour? Or are you always revving up to get past things at 90 miles an hour? Are you trying to get from one checklist to the next? I mean, Jesus had a lot to do, right? He's resurrected. In that moment, he could have said, hey, I'm resurrected. I'm the hope dealer. I'm the wounded healer. I'm exactly who you need. Just see it right now. No, isn't it interesting so many times we see Jesus in the Gospels where he has the answer, but he's asking questions. And instead of coming with power and force, he comes with all the senses we need in light of who he is. He not only has words to say, he looks at people and he helps others look at people. And one of the most vulnerable moments where you have Jairus, who's the father of a dying daughter, for all the fathers in here, how vulnerable are you when your kids were sick and you loved them and you could do nothing for them? Jesus is with Jairus in that moment and the crowd's around him. And then you've got a woman who's been bleeding out for the women in here that have been marginalized or dismissed or your pain or abuse has been discarded. This woman had a dozen plus years and she didn't want to be seen by the crowd. She didn't even necessarily want Jesus to see her. But in the beauty of that moment, she reaches out because with faith, if I just touch his robe, something's going to happen that I need. And when she touches the robe, she's healed. But isn't it beautiful that Jesus turns all the senses of sight in that crowd to behold the woman? Not to look down on her, but to elevate her. To say, look at this faith of this woman that has been discarded. See with your senses what the kingdom of heaven does. See his vulnerability. Who touched me? Power went out from me. Peter's going at 90 miles per hour. No, 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 Lord, the bigger miracle's ahead at Jairus' house. How can you even ask who touched you? No, no, no. Who touched me? Fairlawn, 
so many people in your life right now, whether at your job or in your neighborhood, are longing to be touched. They're longing to be seen. But if you're moving without vulnerability, if you're moving at 90 miles per hour, you'll miss them. And you'll miss the moments when Jesus wants to say, if you want to behold the kingdom, it's in this vulnerable space. We've got to admit, oftentimes we're like, Peter, Lord, you're omniscient, you're omnipresent, you're omnipotent, you can do all these things. Why do you need me to look? The disciples knew, not only Peter, but everybody in that crowd needed to be vulnerable with the woman. Need to see her elevated. And in that pause, servant comes, says, Master, your daughter's dead, and Jesus steps into that vulnerable moment. No, 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 she's not dead. She's just sleeping. Gets to the house. People laugh at him. They mock him. Don't you know? Don't you think we know what dead is? Fair long, we're talking about the risen Savior, and that's why the title of this message is, The Lord is Really Risen. No, really, he's the deaf defeater. No, really, he's the wounded healer. No, really, he's the hope dealer. Even in that vulnerable moment in which a child is dead and everybody in their mourning mocks God and says, don't you know this can't be resurrected? Don't you know the reality of this pain? In that moment, Jesus doesn't leave. He goes in and with words so tender, like a parent saying, to a child, little girl, it's time to get up. That's how tender and vulnerable he is with us. Because he's the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. On the Emmaus Road, that's what he opens for them. He says, all these things had to happen. All these things in which you see a vulnerable God that can't defeat death, because they list it off. We had hoped that this one was the Messiah who would redeem Israel. And even so, it's the third day. They're telling Jesus his promises back to him. And then he reminds them of the promises of who God is. The God who is close with Adam and Eve in the garden, walking with them in the cool of the day at three miles an hour. The God who is close with Abraham and Sarah, or seemingly barren and says, I am almighty, walk before me. The God who is close with Israel, who says in Leviticus 26, I will walk among you and will be your God. And that includes walking them out of Egypt, walking them through the Red Sea, walking with them in desert spaces. It's the Lord who's close who in Joshua, as they finally enter the promised land, says, love the Lord and walk in all his ways and keep his commandments. And what? Cling to him. All the way back in Joshua, walking in his ways, but not only that, clinging to him. Like that woman who was sick reached out and touched his robe. We hear King David in some of his last words saying, keep the charge of the Lord, walking in his ways. We see Solomon in the temple prayer in Second Chronicles. There's no God like you in heaven or on earth, keeping covenant and showing steadfast love to your servants who do what? Who walk before you with all their heart. And then we see in the prophet who we hear from the most, probably the most vulnerable prophet, the weeping prophet. Jeremiah says in chapter 7, verse 23, walk in all God's ways all the ways that he commands you, that it may be well. But then Jeremiah also tells us what it's like when we don't walk with God. But my people have forgotten me. False gods made them stumble. In the ancient roads, they walk into side roads. Fairlawn, if you're walking on a side road today, come back to Jesus. That side road is a road that'll harden your heart. It's a road apart from him, the giver of life, It's the one that truly can give you hope. We use the words, praise the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, a little bit earlier in the message. And if you look at 1 Peter 1.3, 
the continuation of those words, or praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. There is hope alive with this Jesus who walks our curious roads and our vulnerable roads. And honestly, vulnerable roads still captivate us, right? They're in all our popular storytelling. If you're a Lord of the Rings fan, it was a curious and vulnerable road that took Frodo all the way from the Shire to Mordor. If you're a Cormac McCarthy fan like me and you're willing to dive into some darker spaces, the road is about a father and son post-apocalypse where seemingly there's no hope and yet there's a love between, between them that's almost like the father and the son and the Holy Spirit. That's a fire that burns in a pitch black area. Even Mad Max Fury Road, a furious road, a road that was burning in its own way is about a loner who ends up finding community when he becomes vulnerable instead of hardened. See, we still write about roads like this. We still wonder about roads like this. We still hope for roads like this. Why? Because we need the peace of the Christ who is among us. With the Mayus City Church, we pass the peace, and sometimes I like to use the words that I've learned from our Eastern Orthodox sisters and brothers. During the time of their divine liturgy, instead of saying, the peace of Christ be with you, and whether in Catholic say also with your spirit, or maybe in Protestant, also with you, they say, Christ is among us. I remember the first time I heard it, the response was, Christ is in our midst. And man, that burned something in me. Probably because I just wasn't used to it, but also just this other sense of like, we're not just talking about this Jesus that is you know, invisible and ethereal and beyond us. We're talking about the one who said he'd never leave us nor forsake us. Christ is among us. Christ is in our midst. And you know what one other response in the Orthodox Church is that they shout and sing together? He is and ever shall be. What a response. Christ is among us. Christ is in our midst. He is and ever shall be. Fair long. That's a reality not only for you as a community in this area, in the Blackstone Valley, that's a reality for you personally. As real as it was on the Emmaus Road, it is real for us today. Because this road is not only a curious road, this road is not only a vulnerable road, this road is a healing road. Because when they got to Emmaus, and looking again at verses 30, through 34, it says, he was at the table with them and he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he began to give it to them. And then their eyes were open and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight and they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? And they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem and there they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true the Lord is risen and has appeared to Simon. And I love how in the New Living Translation, to get that exclamational point a little bit more is, the Lord is really risen. <laughs> it's, it's somehow true. But why do you say it's a healing road? Why in the midst of this burning is there healing? Well, many of you know what it's like to cauterize a wound. In order to close it, you need to bring some heat to it. This moment, I think, with the Word of God, not only revealing Himself in the Scriptures, but being present with Him, he was, he was cauterizing a moment. And I think even more so, we see it in the breaking of the bread. The language that's used here is Eucharistic language. So when He takes the bread, and He gives thanks, and He breaks it, that brings us back to Passover. Brings us back to the moments when He was feeding the thousands when he said, unless you eat of my body or drink of my blood, you have no part with me. That moment he breaks it, it's a revelation. Maybe even, I mean, I don't know, it doesn't tell us in Luke's gospel, but if he was walking that road and they didn't recognize him, I wonder if he lifted up the bread, which is often done in Jewish custom, did his sleeves drop and did they see something on his skin? 
What are those scars? But then when he breaks it, we could even look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, quoting from Isaiah. He himself bore our sins on his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds we are healed. After giving thanks and blessing it, he broke it. And then they knew it was him. He's the one that was broken. He's the one that was crucified. He's alive. He's really risen. And you got to remember, it's late. And the road from Jerusalem to Emmaus is not a safe road, so it's dark. Remember earlier they had said, no, no, the hour's getting late. Stay with us. Don't go on by yourself. There's not only interaction with them that's good where they're like, man, he's opened up the scriptures and the law and the prophets and maybe there's more we need to hear. Stay with us. But they're trying to be hospitable to the stranger. Maybe you're not from here. You, you obviously weren't visiting Jerusalem that long. You didn't hear about the crucifixion. Maybe you're not from around here. It's not good to be out late. But that's what's so powerful about this. It says immediately when they knew it was him, the whole world changed because even the danger and the darkness of night could not keep them from bringing good news. They had to tell people. And the beauty is, is the Emmaus Road is the story of God. It's creation. God walks with humanity in the cool of the day. It's the crisis of rebellion and sin we had hope, but here is the fallout of the world. It's the covenant promises of God being fulfilled in Jesus. He opened up the law and the prophets to reveal the burning, healing nature of who he was. He reveals himself in cross and crown at the table when he breaks the bread as the Christ, the Messiah. And now the church is sent back into the dark, into the danger, into the despair with a living hope that's greater than anything they could encounter on that road from Emmaus back to Jerusalem. Farrell, on the roads you're walking right now, they may look dark, they may look despairing or dangerous, but there is nothing greater than the one who is with you. And to help close my sermon, I was reminded of that. I need to be reminded of this. I preach this stuff to myself. It's why I wear a shirt that says Hope Dealer on it because if I'm with Jesus, then there's a living hope in me because the resurrected one is on the throne and has given me his spirit. So there's hope to be dealt with in any situation and sometimes it's asking a question. Sometimes it's walking quietly on a road. Sometimes it's breaking bread with someone in a dark night. But recently I've had the privilege of getting to go into a prison MCI Shirley is north of here, probably about 45 minutes away from you all. My friend Travoris Weaver gets to serve as a chaplain there, and it took me about a year and a half to go through the orientations and the paperwork to walk that road to be able to be allowed to step into the prison. By God's grace and generosity, I've had the honor to preach the gospel, and the first time that I was invited to preach <laughs> Stepped in, it's about 7.30, worship and song time is almost done, and uh, I said, Javoris, how long do you want me to preach? Ask some of the worship and song leaders, and I'm like, Pastor, you got about 70 minutes. Anybody ever preached a 70-minute sermon? Mercy. And for some of you all, I'm probably a little too loud this morning, I'm a little too passionate, but in that space, it was no holds barred. There was no holding back. I got to be... In all the ways that God has created me, often too loud, uh, a little too passionate, um, just preached my guts out. And hopefully it was the Holy Spirit, not just Mike trying to exhaust himself. But the second time I got to preach, got to the end of the message, and Pastor Forrest said, hey, man, if there's any of you that want to talk to Pastor Sully after the service, you can. So I was talking to some guys, and there was one down the aisle. So I'm sitting here not above talking, and there was one man staring, an inmate who was looking straight at me. And there's about 40, 50 inmates in there, and I don't know all their sentences. Some have sentences that'll be short. Some have sentences that have given them 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. 
But he started walking toward me and was like, all right, Lord, you're here. What's this moment for? And he came up to me and the message I'd preached on was forgiveness. He said, uh, Pastor Sully, I just want you to know that God wanted you here tonight. And I'm not going to give you all the details you shared with me for compassion for those that some of the parts of his story would be a little too intense. But he said, uh, my father's house was the darkest place on earth for me. He said he did things to me that should never happen to a child. And he described some of those things that happened to him. And he said, so in the midst of that, my way of finding family was to join a gang. And he said, but it wasn't just any gang. He said it was a gang that were Satanists. So it's not only a sense of, I need to find some community, but there was a power that was needed that wanted to lash out against the evil of the world, but it was connected to sacrifices to the evil of the world, right? And he said, you see that guy over there? He goes, I was sent to this prison to do a hit on him. I was supposed to kill him. So he had a contract to murder one of the inmates. He said, I didn't know he was a follower of Jesus. But in the midst of my planning to kill him, I encountered Jesus. And for some of us, the reality of his story is so much foreign territory for us. It seems maybe even a little too imaginative. This is somebody that not only knew the demonic in his family, he knew the demonic in most of his story. He lived by it. He worshipped it. He engaged it. But Jesus met him on his road and rescued him. And he said, I said, now when I get to talk to guys that have been in that gang, and they say, I got to get out of this, I get to say to them, the only way you can get out is through Jesus. The things that are binding you on your road, the only way you'll get freedom is through Jesus. And this was the beauty of the moment he said, Pastor Mike, you preached on forgiveness. He said, my father's dead now. And part of how I disciple others is to disciple them that if we've been forgiven by this God, then we get to be forgivers, no matter if people deserve it or not. And to be honest, none of us deserve all the forgiveness God gives us. But he said, tonight, I want you to know I had carried that burden of not being able to forgive my father, but because of the gospel, that burden has been lifted. And I don't tell you that, Fairlawn, because I had anything to do with it. You know, the funny thing was, is less than 48 hours before I went in to preach, I felt like God was asking me to completely change my message. I wasn't going to preach on forgiveness. But on a night, two nights before I went into that prison, I think Jesus was with me in a way that says, I need you to preach something else to be on the road with them. And so by faith, I texted Trevoris, got a little bit of wise counsel. Hey, Trevoris, I know he said I was going to be preaching on this, but I think God, God wants me to preach on forgiveness through prayer. And Trevoris said, go for it. See, that's... That's the shock and awe of being on the road with Jesus where in some moments maybe we don't recognize him. In some moments we're wondering where he is. In some moments we're saying, well, we had hoped this is what you were going to do. In some moments we're listening and things are burning inside us but we're not fully understanding. But Jesus is walking with us every step of the way. Because our hope in suffering is not merely to gaze on the biography of an ancient man frozen in the pages of the Bible. Let me say that again. This is from Tish Harrison Warren in her book, Prayers in the Night, of which she wrote after she lost a child. Our hope in suffering is not merely to gaze on the biography of an ancient man frozen in the pages of the Bible. No, the story of the gospel is not a mere mantra or a relic of history. It is alive and ongoing because he is really risen. The work of Jesus continues even now in our everyday lives. So Fairlawn, be on the really risen road with the really risen Jesus. It's a curious road, but it's a road in which he moves you from darkness to light. 
It's a vulnerable road, but it's a road in which he moves you from distress to peace. And it's a healing road because it's a road in which he moves you from death to life. Will you walk with this three mile an hour God? And will you not only sing together this morning, but live into the prayer, the cry, the hope. Oh master, let me walk with thee. Let's pray.